Several months ago, we shot our very first music video on our virtual production studio. And now that it's finally been released, we're able to share with you the behind the scenes of the entire production. It was a while back, so you'll notice my hair was a little bit longer, but we're gonna show you the entire behind the scenes of how we did it, from the original concept to the production and the things that we were able to incorporate into virtual production that would have made shooting this on a green screen almost impossible. Today we are wrapping up after a music video shoot in our studio here. Shot it on the red. It was a really simple concept. The, the uh, person that was creating the video and the, and the musician both came to us and said, hey, we've got this idea of a girl in the forest and, and doing like this long wonder style that's kind of popular in a lot of modern music videos. So let's take that concept and let's push it. Let's, let's do it in, in, the, in our uh, virtual production studio here and then let's also add some elements. Let's play around. We, we added some fog, we added some snow. Uh, we even played around with uh, kind of this sunrise effect at the very end. Over here, we've got CineDrive, which uh, this is my main motion control system. This is kind of like an erector set of uh, different possibilities. Uh, we used it fairly simple here. This was just a dolly in. We have the, the uh, slider at a slight angle so that we can kind of keep it out of the shot. Uh, as it got wider, but the camera would push in and then it stayed kind of very fairly close on most of the the, the video and then it pulled out and then we, we revealed kind of like a seasonal change. Um, we got this red couch that my wife picked up uh, to do. She does a lot of photography, so she wanted to have this cool couch she found and uh, it fit really well for the aesthetic of what we wanted for this music video. Here we've got, this is the, the Matthews panel stand. Uh, I. I'm loving these these crank stands. I first got one of these. Uh, it wasn't the panel stand. It was just another one of their, their riser stands. I got it because I have uh, this Intellitech F800, just a giant head of a light that uses a junior pin. And trying to hoist it was just a nightmare of a thing. So getting a crank that you can just very quickly raise the light, that is a huge saver. And of course, this is on roller, so it's easy to move around. So the reason we're using it in this fashion is uh, I have my other IntelliTech, uh, or one of my other IntelliTech lights here. This is the Mega Light Cloth. It's a big old light, LED panel by color. And this is um, roughly a three by four and a half, five foot light. Um, that's I use this a lot for keying interviews. This is kind of my go-to light. It all fits into this, this case right here. Um, and makes it super easy to, to go around with. I, I showed you guys a, a video of our camera van several years ago and, and we still have it, I love that thing. But a lot of times uh, we would have to travel with another vehicle, our Suburban and camera trailer, our, our grip trailer. And in more recent years, we haven't always had uh, the size of a full crew. So, so I wanted to have a camera or a lighting package I could keep in the camera van. And this mega light cloth has been my go-to key light for a long time. It's big, it's soft, and it's very light. Um, you know, and, and the reason that was necessary here is because I wanted to overhead uh, the light over the top. So we boomed out the light right here through a sandbag on the other end just to give it some good counterbalance. But that light is so light that I could easily throw it over the top of the talent. And the reason we did that is because we were in a forest scene. And if you really think about like, where does light come from in a forest scene? It comes from overhead. Like most of the trees would prevent like light coming from the side for the most part. So we kind of want to match the, the direction of where the lighting would be coming from. So we overheaded that light. And as, as I've talked about many times, in order to keep the light off of the screen, we needed to have it uh, using a grid. And it, unfortunately, this light can come with its own uh, honeycomb grid. So that was awesome. But we had lots of different lights all kind of scattered about. We had uh, our overhead kind of backlight here. We had uh, um, the Came TV RGB lights. We had our, our, our big uh, light over here. We just we, we had them all kind of working in different ways uh, to, to come together and create that, that aesthetic. We, we got the snow machine running again. Uh, again, we wanted that that kind of soft, really gentle, plinky plunky snow, not heavy, but just kind of just magical type of a snow. So for that, I, I really feathered it this time around. I just kind of tapped the button a little bit. I didn't even hold it down. I just tap it and it just kind of spurt it out, just really gently flow. And that's, so that was really nice to have. Um, we did use the fog machine. Again, all these things that we couldn't typically do if we were shooting against a green screen. Uh, another thing I did that we can't use on a green screen, coming back over to the red camera, 
is I have uh, on here a uh, one eighth super mist black. Um, so that's that's a a very gentle diffusion filter. It's just there to kind of soften the image since we're shooting a female uh, artist, we wanted to be more flattering. But again, if you're shooting on a green screen, you can't have a diffusion filter on top of that. It would make it harder to get a clean key. So these are all these things that we can't typically do on a green screen. It's really easy to do when you're using a virtual production. Now you probably noticed we've been using a lot of Kessler Crane equipment. I've been working with their tools for over 10 years, I, I have their jibs, their dollies, their sliders. And when they moved into motion control, uh, it was really great to be able to have not just a great motion control system, but one that integrated with all the other accessories that I already had with them. Uh, Eric and the entire team at Kessler have been really great to work with. And we've had the privilege of kind of getting uh, to test out new equipment as it comes along. The Cine Shooter system namely has been an amazing tool that kind of bridged the gap between the bigger Cine Drive system and uh, their smaller second shooter system. And I was able to work with Kessler to give you guys a special discount code. If you head on over to KesslerCrane.com and use the code CREATIVEEDGE, you can actually get 10% off your next order. We still had a lot to manage for the virtual production. I handled the camera, the lighting, all that kind of stuff, and Ben was really focusing purely on um, all the, the Unreal Engine stuff. So I'm gonna flip the camera on and let him talk about that. Thanks, Tony. So one of the challenges that we had run into in past practice pod projects, past practice projects, was we were running into an issue with the amount of warmth, how cool, how warm it was, uh, our image was in Unreal on the computer versus what we were able to project up versus what was captured in the in the in camera. And so what we actually ended up doing was we made the image in Unreal just a little bit warmer because we can't really do much once it's past daylight. There's not much we can do, just limitations of our projector. Uh, but by creating the image, making the image a little bit warmer, we are able to match a little bit better with what the camera natively shoots. This is going to be different for every project. This is going to be different for every camera. Um, so it's just something that was we wouldn't have known unless we had played with it. And after our trials and the like, the snow scene that we did, where it was so so um, went way daylight, we weren't able to match that in studio with our natural with our lighting. So we were able to adjust that in Unreal, and it turned out beautifully where we were, we were better able to match the lighting that we have on set, practical lighting, versus what was in screen. Um, some other interesting things, we, we kind of figured out particle systems. That was a big learning experience, uh, using uh, the snow effect in the background and then making it match the practical uh, snow effect that we had in the studio. We couldn't have, we had to have it falling at about the same rate and we had to have it falling about the same size as it would be in the background. So all those things kind of came together. It was one big learning curve that we all threw together and it was a major team effort to be able to get everything to come together and it did and it looks absolutely beautiful. There were times where you really had a hard time telling what was falling on screen, what was falling uh, on set and it all just kind of came together. A lot of, a lot of par parts had to come together um, and it was just neat to be able to see all of it uh, wrapped up in the final in the final shot. So here's uh, the came RGB LED. I've talked about that in past shoots. Uh, one thing that we used it for this time around is we wanted to have kind of this sunrise moment towards the end of the music video. And so I dialed this to a nice warm color and we tried dimming it up, but even with like having an increments of 1%, it was still a little steppy. You could kind of see the clicking happening between it. So instead, just kind of did it old school. I just panned it towards this black solid here so it minimized the bounce that was happening. And then towards the end of the music video, um, on CineDrive, I could see where the timeline was going. So I knew exactly when uh, the camera was gonna start backing up. And I just really slowly, over the course of probably 30 plus seconds, Stella was on her and it created this really magical uh, sunrise. And having the mixture of the diffusion filter on the front of the camera and the fog, you know, the fog machine running, that light just catch that and it really just lit up the whole area and created this really beautiful look of a sunrise. So eventually we'd love to have the ability to do some of that animated in Unreal. Um, again, we were kind of on a tight schedule. We had a lot of logistics to figure out. So we just used static backdrops for this, but we know that there's a lot of potential out there and we could do things like that. We could add yeah. uh, animations. We could do uh, like seasonal transitions in Unreal. We've got some ideas for 
uh, stuff like where we'd be like in a, in a city and the sun is slowly rising over the, the day and then you're seeing, we would match it potentially using something like the panel stand right here, putting a, like a warm light on it and using that crank to slowly raise it so that as that's rising, on the screen, we're having a sunrise happening and matching the two things so that it, it has this like seemingly, uh, you know, like time lapse happening in real time. So there's a lot of cool possibilities. Yeah. And one of the one of the interesting challenges is, you know, if we had a big giant LED volume, that light source is native to the screen so that you get that screen. We have to recreate it. And so that's kind of been an interesting dynamic in learning. All right. How do we do this practically? How do we make it match? And, you know, trying to even go as simple as, yep, maybe just it's turning the, the, the light ever so slowly and just watching that magic happen. And it really turned out really nice. That's so why I see all these lights set up like this light in some of the scenes I used it, sometimes I didn't. And, and having the variety of tools available made it easy to uh, pull in just a quick, okay, this, you know, this light we're going to use as, as the sunrise. This light, you know, we use this kind of as a, a side key. You know, even though I said that the overhead lighting was the main motivation, the truth is if I was actually shooting this in a forest, I would still be bringing in either bounce or another key light that would be, you know, filling in the shadows. Like for, for her, if, if the light was only toppy, it would be a little unflattering. You would get some darker eye sockets. It might showcase, you know, some, uh, you know, bad complexion or anything like that. So filling in a little bit of that helps even it out. So yes, it's not perfectly realistic to the environment, but at the same time, I would probably be lighting the environment anyway. So having kind of like, I would kind of turn off the rest of the lights, try and get the top light to match as best as possible uh, to the environment, and then start adding in lights just to fill it in. So it's kind of this painting procedure where you've got like, this is the base base coat, and now I'm gonna tweak it with other lights to so that they don't overwhelm it and don't make it feel too fake but still give it a nice polish like you would expect in a video production. And that's part of the fun of virtual production is you really do get to create as you go along and the, the possibilities are endless. So whether what you do on screen, whether it's a TV or a projector or a LED volume and to the lighting and as simple as, you know, if, if you're set up at home, doesn't have all this lighting, get creative. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do with just flashlights and small, you know, where, where you're adding your window. And so it's, it's a fun thing to be able to play with. So the last thing I'll mention too real quick is you might notice that this couch is kind of high and that's because we are on a riser platform. And since the fact is we can't really raise or lower the screen very easily, we could raise it if we wanted to, but we can't lower it because the projector has its minimum distance. This projector, you can't change the, the height of where the beam actually hits. So that's the lowest the projector screen can go. And with the talent sitting, uh, we were concerned that we were going to get the bottom of the screen would be showing up like above the, the, the back of the couch for the proper distance and everything. So we just simply raised up the couch and then it was able to fit better on the screen. So simple things like that where, you know, be moving instead of thinking like I'm going to move the screen, move the talent, move the camera, move everything else and let, let the screen be locked off the way it is. So that's, those are the kind of tools. And, and we've got other ideas that we're going to want to possibly incorporate. We're thinking about possibly, possibly building a turntable so that we can do some really dynamic uh, orbiting shots. Again, thinking that you can't move the screen or move the camera too much. So instead lock off the screen and then move the object around it and then move in Unreal Engine having that, uh, that orbiting within the engine. So something we want to do, there's a lot of work left to do that. So we'll see if that's something that we get around to. But uh, it's been a lot of fun to finally be able to incorporate this. We've got some other shoots coming up that we'll show you guys the behind the scenes on. But uh, first one in the bag yep. for virtual production uh, for end product. And yep. uh, we're excited. So we'll be sharing that video when, it, when it's all completed. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. See you next time.